Well, good afternoon if you are on the East Coast of the United States. Good evening if you are in Malta or somewhere else in the European Union or outside the European Union in North Africa. <laughs> uh, greetings around the world, wherever this may find you. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays. I have a wonderful guest today, a friend of mine. And before I introduce him, I want to mention that today being April 23rd, it is a few things. It is Shakespeare's birthday. It is the conductor John Andre Nozeda's birthday, and he will be my guest in June. And it happens to be the first anniversary of my beginning these broadcasts for Idajo, which I have loved doing. And I wanted a very special guest for my first anniversary. And I'm being joined today by Joseph Kaleha, the outstanding tenor from Malta. We're going to talk about being a tenor. We're going to talk about being Maltese. But first, Joseph, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you so much and a happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, I'm Fred and um, hello, everyone who are listening. I hope that people uh, tune in and because Fred is very knowledgeable and um I'm not just being, you know, throwing idle flattery to Fred, but um, his live interview in person in New York a couple of years ago, I think three years ago or something like that, um, was really one of the best I've ever had. And uh, so thank you. A little bit of compliments your side. Your I way. appreciate that. And I have new questions for you. Uh, we're not going to talk much about the pandemic because everyone knows about the pandemic, but I'm going to say one thing about it. Um, I because I've not been able to travel or move for the past year, have watched a lot of film on television. I've made it a point. I don't, to be honest, like opera on TV and video. I like opera live and I love opera, obviously. But I've been watching lots of films, very good films and seeing not movies I've seen 10 times, but old films that I had never seen in my lifetime because I've worked in theaters and therefore... I'm busy at night, usually. And I've discovered an actor. I know what you're going to say. Yeah. <laughs> who's a, who's a namesake? <laughs> Joseph Kaleha. Yeah. And yeah. he's kind of wonderful. He was born in Malta in 1897. He died in Malta in 1975. But he had an important Hollywood career. He was in the film Algiers with Charles Boyer. He was in My Little Chickadee with Mae West. Uh, he was fantastic in the film Touch of Evil with Orson Welles, which I saw him in recently. And I did some research about him because I wanted to know whether he's related to you, and I will ask you in a moment. But Joseph, did you know that when Francis Ford Coppola was making The Godfather, he offered the role of Don Corleone not to Marlon Brando, but to Joseph Kaleha? Yeah. who was unwell and unfortunately had to turn down the opportunity. And only then did it go to Marlon Brando. To Mar so he was already, ready? yeah, um, he was already in Malta when he got that offer, but he was, um, as you said, um, um, quite elderly and he didn't, um, um, you know, feel up for it. I, I didn't know him, unfortunately. So in Malta is the only place in the world where the surname is Kalea. So it's not uh, with the Spanish Calleja, but it's Kalea. And uh, he uh, started his career in the U.S. Um, with the name Vincent Spurin or Sperin. I don't know um, um, how, the, uh, how, how exactly you pronounce that. Um, reference to whether he's related. Um, I was contacted once by uh, a Californian, a guy who lives in California, whose uh, who's, uh, family originated from Malta, but in the mid 18th century. So a long time ago. And he did very well for himself, and he funded a project, a DNA, uh, with one of the major companies that does them. And he, he has a theory that all the Calais in Europe and North America, not Hispanic, so not Mexican or Filipino, sorry, but, but um, the, the European or Mediterranean Calais, are all related. And he had sent, um, I think, tens, if not hundreds of test kits to all over the world. Um, and he sent it to me as well uh, with a major DNA testing company. And, and, and it turns out that I'm a 99.99% match. So in Malta, probably all the Kaleas are um, related. Um, it's one of the oldest surname in Malta. I think it's President Malta from 1492, so a long time ago. Um, but, uh, but yes, probably we, we are. But unfortunately for me, um, I never um, um, get, um, I mean, get to meet him. And, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think he... He died uh, before I was even seventy-five. Yeah, yeah, before I was even born, so that was impossible. So I, I was born in seventy-eight, three years later. 
So, but yeah, but I mean, he's a big hero here in Malta. Unfortunately, a bit forgotten now because he he died um, over 45 years ago. But um, a big hero and a, and one of the great Hollywood character actors of. His time, I think he was also in the movie Gilda with opposite yes. uh, Rita Hayworth. Rita Hayworth, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. If I'm not mistaken, so it was a, it was a, and he was a singer as well. Apparently, he was a baritone. Well, I and, discovered he began as yeah, an opera singer. As an opera Europe. singer, so so you see, I'm yeah. doing something wrong, Fred. <laughs> well, you've been in a film. Yeah, I've I, been. Yeah, yeah. I went to see The Immigrant a number of years ago, and had no idea that you were in the film, starring Marion Cotillard, who was always wonderful. And there you were playing Enrico Caruso. Very short cameo. But yeah, but that, that was very funny how it turned out. So I'm a movie buff. I'm a big movie buff. Um, That's why I know all this stuff about Joseph Kalea, the other Joseph Kalea. <laughs> and um, I, I get this very uh, uh, nice email from a director uh, called James Gray that I knew uh, through his collaborations with Joaquin Phoenix, amongst others. And I thought it was my manager uh, uh, playing a prank. So I, I sent an email back, plenty of expletives and of uh, curse words. I said, listen, don't, don't you have anything better to do? And, and he said, listen, no, no, this is really James Gray. And I just watched you at the Lucia, the Metropolitan Opera, a few nights ago. And uh, will you call me on this number? So I, the number was American and I felt awful because I had just told this guy, um, you know, um, plenty of awful things. Uh, I don't know the, the age of, listen, of listeners here, so I'm going to be PG. So anyway, we, 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 we talked and we immediately hit it off. And long story short, we're filming on location, Ellis Island. There's uh, Marion Cotillard, President said. There's Jeremy Renner, also known um, as Hawkeye in The Avengers. And uh, my, scene, uh, my scene came. Now in movies, um, a minute means an eight or nine hours of filming. You know, so three minutes is a whole day. It's it's over twelve hours. So I was there waiting for it for for eleven hours in the twelfth hour before we send everyone home. It's one o'clock in the morning and I'm knackered because I've been there since early afternoon. Oh, the same day, I had um, the music piped in my ears and I sang it live in Ellis Island um, 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 on on the set. And some movie trivia: it was one take. I promise you, all the other scenes. But he's oh, this was fantastic. So then I sang live to, to hidden earphones um, in my ears. So it was very funny when we finished um, 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 the, the take, the, uh, I've overheard some of the extras. Oh my gosh, this guy is so good. It's like he was really doing it. And of course <laughs> I was, this is a true story um, in, in, um, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in the making of the, of the immigrant. But it was a lovely experience. And James Gray is a fantastic guy and fantastic director. For listeners who may not know, Ellis Island is an island off the coast of Manhattan and Staten Island in New York City. And it's near the Statue of Liberty where immigrants would have to arrive. And they had to go through a series of tests for language, for diseases and so on. My relatives all came through Ellis Island. And when an American talks about Ellis Island, what they usually mean is that this is where we first landed in the United States. And it's yeah. thought that one in six Americans has a descendant who landed at Ellis Island. So that's a remarkable figure. Now, yeah. Malta has its own language, which is a Sicilian Arabic combination with Norman French and all kinds of things thrown in there. And I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask you to say all those curse words that you would have said in English, say them in Maltese, because I Eric, want to hear this out. <laughs> okay, so Maltese is a beautiful language. Um, as you said, it's a mix of um, um, Ciclo Arabic, but there's also uh, lots of Hebrew words, um, lots of French words, Italian vocabulary mostly as well, 55% about of the language, but I'm not going to say the swear words because it's the perfect language to swear in. And the swear words in Maltese, for those who understand it, are horrible. So I'm not going to even dare. I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, honestly, it's really, I mean, multi swear words are very, 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 very bad. So it's a beautiful language, uh, especially you in person and I'll open a bottle. I'll, of wine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> With a bottle of wine, not broadcasting, I'll, I'll, I'll venture, but definitely not because it's really awful. So when it comes question. to swear words, it's a beautiful language, but when it comes well, I need to, to swear words, I need to learn them. Yeah. Um, we in America now have a very famous Maltese American who is our secretary of transportation. He's the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana. 
His name is Pete Buttigieg, and he ran for president last year, and he made a very good impression. Obviously, Joseph Biden won, but Buttigieg made such a good impression that Biden hired him to be in his administration. Have you met or communicated with Pete Buttigieg, and does he know of you being the other famous Maltese apart from him? <laughs> I have no idea if he knows I exist. Of course, I know about him, and it's pronounced exactly Pete Buttigieg. 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 Buttigieg is, it's, it's, it's um, people who don't speak Maltese, they make it actually harder than it is. So it's Buttigieg. 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 It's, it's like, boom. And he's, um, he, is a, he was a breath of fresh air in, 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 in the American politics. I, I'm not an expert about American politics, but I do uh, follow uh, uh, very often um, what's, uh, what's, what's going on. Um, and uh, he's dynamic. He's lovely. He speaks perfect Maltese. Um, he, um, you know, you, we might be staring, we might be looking at the future um, um, American president. Who knows? I, I mean, think so. To I have, think it's a To have an American president with, with Maltese heritage, gee, that, was, that would be, that would be <laughs> quite extraordinary because um, I don't know if uh, your viewers and listeners know, but Malta is extremely small. It's about, I think, 200 square kilometers. I think it's 125, 130 square miles. That means that it's 19 miles north to south, and it's about 14 miles west to east. It's very small, with a population of little more than half a million, um, and I think I think includes the um, the, the the immigrants, so our foreign workers and our foreign residents. Um, some of them, of course, become Maltese as well. And Malta has always been a melting pot since you know if you go back in the thousands of years, it's positioned exactly in the middle of the Mediterranean, exactly between north to south between Europe and North Africa and between the states of Gibraltar and the Middle East, with west, west to east. It's like someone has placed it there. Nonetheless, such a small area has 7,000 years of history. Um, it has monuments older uh, by a thousand years, um, older than the pyramids of the first dynasty, nine or 800 years older than Stonehenge, eight, eight centuries. It's a long, well, long I've been time. to those. I cannot pronounce them. They too have a lot of Gs in them and they mean... There's Gantia, there's Gantia, there's Mnaidra, there's um, Hajarim, there's the beautiful um, underground temple, the Hypogeum, which is an acoustic marvel. It, it, I, I, you know, pe people still don't know who built um, the, the stuff. We, we have very little information. Um, some people say it, it, it was aliens, um, which which perfectly would explain me, um, you know, as, as as they're one of their descendants. But but yeah, but um, it, Malta is extraordinary. Uh, Malta is um, when it comes to these things, the history, the people who have been here. Recently, it was disclosed, it was classified before that post World War II, there was a meeting of the Big Three, being Teddy Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin in in, Franklin, in Malta. Franklin. In Mal Exactly. Frank Roosevelt, sorry, Frank Roosevelt and and uh, and uh, Stalin and Winston Churchill, um, as well, uh, um, the, you know, George Bush Senior signed the end of the Cold War in Malta. He told me this personally when he came to see me in Houston Grand Opera in the Opera Madame Butterfly, and and he told me uh, he 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 was so we spoke for more than ten minutes, so I was fifteen minutes on stage. He wasn't interested in my voice. He said, oh, you're saying beautifully, but you know what happened here? He said, you know, I, 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 I signed. And apparently the CIA secret code for the mission was Operation Sea Sickness because there, was, there were gale force, hurricane, almost hurricane, um, uh, close to hurricane force uh, winds. And instead of signing it in international waters, as was planned, they had the uh, carrier, whatever it was, had to uh, berth um, in the south of Malta of the Freeport. And that's where, they, that's where he signed it. With um, with uh, with Gorbachev, um, so so yeah, so Malta is is you know, um, um, and I think from the uh, presidents, um, I think Bill Clinton uh, probably knows most about Malta. He he, you know, including the the Great Siege, three cities. You know, he he he, he, he you know, it was it was very impressive when he when he said that, and um, uh, to have all that knowledge and. Um, you know, we we're like you know we're like a li li little snappy dog with a Napoleon complex. You know, we we're, we're very you know we think we're um, we're 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 much bigger than we actually are, um, I, and I think that's a good trait. And um, I'm very proud um, that such a small island with such a small population throughout history has left um, its mark in in the various histories of the different peoples. You know, the Romans, the Arabs, the 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 um, the French Knights of St. John, and of course, our last um, colonists were the uh, British that were in Malta for 200 years.
Well, I do have a few more questions about Malta, but since you brought up George Bush Sr., I'm going to say something about him. In American politics, for the most part, it seems not to be an honorable thing to acknowledge publicly that you like opera. And George Bush Sr. and Barbara Bush liked opera a lot. And what is not known about George Bush, who I never voted for, is that he increased funding for the National Endowment for the Arts more than any president. Really? But he was that. able to because he didn't have opposition in Congress. Yeah. Bill Clinton wanted to raise it even more, but he had opposition in Congress. But George Bush liked opera very, very much. And um, but he said publicly that he felt that he would not get votes from the people who would vote for him if he said he liked <laughs> opera. So he said he liked country and Western music, which I do, too. Yeah. But I love he, country. Yeah, absolutely. But he felt that he couldn't acknowledge opera as being part of his his interest and his loves. But he okay. was a big opera loving president. Um, Recently, Malta has been back in the news because with the death of Prince Philip in England, in the United Kingdom, I learned, I didn't know this, that before Elizabeth became queen and Philip became prince, the consort, they lived in Malta and they had a wonderful, romantic, early life as a couple in Malta. And when I watched the BBC recently after Philip's death, there was considerable footage of, in black and white mostly, of Malta and of them smiling and laughing and holding hands and so on. Did you grow up knowing about Elizabeth and Philip in Malta or was that not part of what was discussed? I, I, it, was, it wasn't really pointed out to me when I was a kid. Remember that I left Malta. When I say I left Malta, in inverted commas, I've never actually left the residence um, um, of, of Malta um, out of patriotic reasons, because it would have been much more, um, uh, let's say, favorable, including for tax reasons, had I, had I done that. But for patriotic reasons, I never left Malta as a, res as a residency. So I was always resident in Malta for the past um, next year is my 25th anniversary. I can't believe it. Um, but then um, I was very quickly brought up to speed by Prince Charles himself. Um, I, I sang for the royal family a couple of times. And the first time I did, um, he approached me. So, oh, quite a pipe on you, young man. Um, you know what? Uh, actually, uh, you, you're from Malta. And I was probably conceived there. So Prince Charles actually told me that he was, and it's the first thing he, he, he said, and I have to say he disarmed me completely because I was expecting this really um, uptight, uptight uh, 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 person. And, you know, and, 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 you know, he's, of course, he's, uh, he's, 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 um, he's royalty. And, but in fact, he, he, in actual fact, he was extremely down to earth and, and someone you would really love to share a scotch with, uh, with um, um, which we did. And, um, and so, and it was, it was quite, um, you know, he, he, they really generally love Malta and Malta generally loves the, the royal family. And of course, we have a lot of, a pers you know, a very special relationship. Of course, we always talk about the relationship between America and the, and the United Kingdom, but Malta has as well a very special relationship, uh, especially when you consider the, the Second World War. Malta was crucial to defeat the um, access, especially when it comes to the supply line uh, um, um, of the of the access to North Africa, Malta was continuously uh, damaging that supply supply line till eventually uh, we we broke it. And um, um, some more anecdotes and trivia. Uh, Winston Churchill was an ace. Uh, sorry, the, the first cousin of Winston Churchill was an ace fighter pilot um, from Malta, and he died actually on a on a sortie on a, on a, on a sortie on on Sicily. Um, at the age of 36, which, which was at the time a ripe old age for, a, for an ace fighter pilot. Because yeah. in Malta, all the ace uh, in, in the world, in the Second World War, all the aces, uh, which were young, young men, 18, 17, 18, 19, 20, I'm, I'm not sure if 17 year olds as well, but definitely. And um, they, they used to come to Malta to, to achieve honor, greatness, because it was considered the most dangerous theater um, when it comes to uh, dogfights and the in the Second World War, or one of the most dangerous theaters. And some other curious trivia, which I didn't know before. Um, um, and there's a book 
written by uh, Jonathan Holland. It, it's called Fortress Malda. It is absolutely riveting and magnificent book about the, he's, a, he's, a, he's an English uh, journalist writer, Jonathan Holland. And apparently um, um, they, the, the aces from the both sides of the war used to meet in neutral, neutral territory in Tunisia and party and have drinks together. And then they used to fly and um, out and, and shoot each other the next day or, or, or in the, or, or the ensuing weeks. So you, know, the, you could speak so much about this, about this, um, about this, this period in, in, in Malta, which was also, of course, very difficult because Malta was as well the most bombed place on earth in the Second World War. Not relative to its size, the most tonnage of bomb, the most tonnage of bombs released anywhere in the Second World War were released um, on Malta. I'm aware of that. And in preparation for our conversation, I read up a lot about Malta and especially about the siege of Malta, which was yeah. quite lengthy because yeah. Malta was first attacked by the Germans and it was attacked by the Italians. Then it was taken over by the Allies, not to attack it, but to defend it. And there were many, many battles there. And Winston Churchill uh, loved Malta. Yeah. He spoke about Malta a lot in his writings. And I forget the exact term he used, but he was talking about the position geographically of Malta in the Mediterranean, that it was the perfect landing stage for airplanes, for ships, and for everything yeah. that was necessary to conduct the Second World War. From it the was an unsinkable aircraft carrier. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to get into a little opera. I have one more Malta question. I could ask you many, but I have one more. Just when funny, well. I was a student in Italy, when we were born, actually, um, I just even before that, I lived in a hotel in Rome for six months called the Croce di Malta, mm -hmm. the Maltese Cross. And I didn't know at the time what the Maltese Cross was. And related to that, I didn't know about the Knights of Malta, the Knights of St. John. Would you talk about that whole phenomenon? Because I know it's central to what it means to be from Malta. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. Um, we owe our most of our identity today to the Knights of St. John. When the Knights of St. John, uh, they were chased away from Rhodes by the Turkish uh, Empire. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure here. I'm not, I don't have a history book in front of me. So I think it was Suleiman the Magnificent, but I'm not sure. So you gotta, well, people have to check on that. But apparently the story goes or history goes that they fought so valiantly that the, that the commander of the fleet or whatever it, whatever it was spared them. And they wandered about uh, two years in the Mediterranean until the King of Spain gave them Malta for the price of a Maltese falcon, which, which probably was, it was symbolic and some other stuff. And they, I think they came to Malta in, in the 1535, if I'm not mis, mis, mistaken. Then it was the great siege in 1565 when um, the, uh, when the, uh, the Turks attacked again and they were outnumbered, I think, in Malta they had 10,000 total troops, including the population and the knights. And I think the Turks were 50 or 60,000. And they managed to beat them, um, heavily outnumbered, but they managed to beat them thanks to the fortifications. And then of course the Knights built uh, Valletta after that with even more fortifications. And uh, I think that when the Knights came, Malta had a population of 6,000 uh, people. Um, and after I think just 10 years uh, or a decade or, or so, um, the population exploded to 100,000 plus, um, which really were, and the Knights came from all over Europe, as you know. They started out as the Order of Amalfi, so the, 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 the Knights of St. John are actually from Italy, from, from the Napel, Naples uh, region. And uh, that's how then, then after that, you know, they were known as the, Knights, the Order of Amalfi, then the Knights of St. John, then finally the Order of the Knights of Malta. So where, 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 where their base uh, was for hundreds of years. And I think, I'm, I'm not sure that it's, it's, if it still is or if, if Rome, no, I think Malta is still the base and the Grand Master, they still have a Grand Master. Mm -hmm. I think he, he I think he's based in Malta, but I have to be, I stand to be corrected. So what what makes us and the Grand Masters and the Knights are from Portugal, from Spain, from France, from Germany, from of course Italy. So really Malta, if you take a, a DNA sample, we're really a mix and match of all European um, nations. Take me, 
Kalea is probably uh, Spanish or Greek or a mix of two. From my mother's side, her maiden name was Bianco, Italian for white. And that's definitely from, from Sicily, from probably the Western side of Sicily. But um, both families have been in Malta and now today. We're pretty much Maltese, but you find this in Malta that there's a, um, a, 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 an overwhelming um, a Mediterranean blood, including uh, some Lebanese, of course, the Phoenicians that, that, that were in Malta as well. Um, an incredible civilization. So Malta, I like to say Malta is uh, a mix of the best of Europe, of Southern Europe. Um, and uh, if you're mean, uh, you, you could say that we're, we're a mix of the worst. I like to tend to, <laughs> to side with the mix of the best. But yeah, I think that um, um, as especially when it comes to individualism, Malta, um, um, we, we truly uh, excel, case in point, Pete Buttigieg, um, son of, uh, of, of I think, first generation, um, um, his second generation, you know, his, his, his father was a first generation immigrant from, from Malta. Um, I learned, I, I knew about the Knights of Malta and the medical and the hospital element of their provision of medical care. And I learned that the first publicly funded hospital in Malta yeah. was in 1372. Yeah. We in America still don't have national health care. <laughs> And we have some of it, but we have a long way to go. And it struck me that that said a lot about the values. I'm going to call them Christian values as opposed to Catholic values in terms of offering care to the needy. And I know that Malta has had numerous religions, but is predominantly Catholic because of the history of the Knights of Malta and its relation with Italy. First St. Paul, uh, it was St. Paul the Apostle himself 2,000 years ago that was shipwrecked here and he brought um, religion, religion with him here. And then, of course, um, the Knights of St. John, they built this beautiful cathedral, co-cathedral in, in, in Valletta, St. John's co-cathedral, where, where we had uh, a sacred concert a few, just a few weeks ago with my wonderful colleagues, uh, Sandra Radvanovsky, Christian Van Horn, Ramon Tabar, Marvik Monreal, and the Multinational Philharmonic. And that's that's a work of art, such a gem. There's also the largest Caravaggio in, inside, um, the, the beheading of the Baptist. And there's also Saint Jerome by the same artist Caravaggio. So Malta is, again, he, he you know, it, it's, it's just a gem, that, that cathedral. And, and Valletta, in, in, in general, um, I, I forgot who said it, maybe Benjamin Disraeli, I'm not sure, but um, I think he said Valletta is a city of gentlemen built by gentlemen. And I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. So I think it was Disraeli, but I'm not sure uh, that, that he said I that. can say that about Edinburgh as well, but there are not many places you can say that about. Yeah. I mean, to pivot slightly, remaining in Malta, but in talking about the Knights and so on, and the hospital and all of that, it occurred to me that there is a production to be done, maybe as a live opera moving about production, maybe as a film of Parsifal. I think that it would have very deep resonance in Malta. Uh, I don't think Parsifal is in your repertory yet, but... I could sing it and I had I actually two offers already, but yeah. um, what's keeping me because it's of course it's a, it's a quite short short role um what's keeping me is that i'm fluent in several languages but not yet in german and i hate i could but i hate singing in languages that i'm not fluent in um so i'm actually doing german right now quite actively now i picked it up and left let it go a, a couple of years i can i'm quite i can be conversational i understand much more than i can actually speak because of I don't, I don't practice. I can read it very quite well, but you know, in a couple, one or two years, I should be fluent enough to to approach roles like Lohengrin. In fact, I have plans already um, coming up in Lohengrin and Bayreuth. Um, so it's so it's uh, very excited about that in two or three years. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, <laughs> the the problem is I don't have enough lifetimes. There's so much beautiful. And another, you know, the German repertoire is fantastic. The the, the lead, the, the leader, and all that. But there's a Russian repertoire as well. And I, I after German, um, Russian is my next language. And if I can learn that um, to some level, to some extent, I will be very, I will die a very happy man because I'm already fluent in Italian, French, Maltese, English, Spanish, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so, so German and Russian. That would be several languages. That that's not bad. But, but I um, have to work hard for that still. 
I, I, my background is that I did production, direction, staging of operas. And I always try to think not of a concept that may fit just slightly, but given the deep feeling for uh, suffering, for pain, for medical care, for Christian piety and charity, and the fact that there are the knights in in uh, Parsifal and the knights in the yeah, knights Malta Park. would be ideal. I Malta think would be absolutely ideal for that. Whether it was done in outdoor settings, I once worked on a ring production in Arizona where we used the mesas and the outdoor settings to do the different settings of Wagner's ring cycle. But I think Malta would be kind of perfect. So you that and I would be amazing. Have dialogue yeah. about this because I think yeah. it's it would be so deeply felt by the people who perform it. Yeah, absolutely. And Malta is the is the dream for outdoor locations and even inside. Let's remember, yeah. Malta has become the Hollywood of the Mediterranean. All the big productions, Game of Thrones, Gladiator, U571, Munich, uh, World War Z, all, all of them. I mean, um, um, they have filmed in, in, in Malta. Right now they're filming uh, um, uh, with Jared Harris and, and, and uh, Lee Pace, a, a production for Apple TV Foundation. I've actually had them um, at my house because they were filming and we... We had too much vino, of course, um, and the, the producer came for just one hour. David Gore came here for one hour. Six hours later, you know, <laughs> it's okay. Now it's allowed. I have to be on set tomorrow. It's uh, 7 a.m. and I'm here at 1 a.m. But lovely people. And, and as, as well, um, uh, Das Boot is, is um, filming in Malta at the moment. The Malta Film Commission, um, Winston Soparty, my friend as well, they, they have done so much. For this, for this, for this industry in Malta, and of course, the government, um, a series of governments, not just the last, this one at the moment, but a series of governments have really invested and gave good tax breaks to the to the to the um, to the various movie companies along the years, and um, it's thrilling to to see Malta um, in in um, you know shown in such a good light. And I mean, I remember the first time, the first movie, The Clash of the Titans, the first one. Mm -hmm. With Sir Lawrence Olivier as Zeus or as Zeus, and um, you know that that was filmed in 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 in, in Malta extensively. You could still see the window when the Kraken, the one that collapsed a few years ago, I think four years ago or something like that, and you can see you know when the Kraken comes for the for the Virgin for the princess, and um, it, it's it's great to see Malta shown like that. And the fact that I'm a movie buff, of course, it it um, it's it just exciting to you know when I when I see um um you know uh, sometimes i go on set i'm lucky to know people that can take me there and it's great to see for example in the film munich malta disguised as uh, uh streets in in israel like in, in tel aviv etc etc i mean it's 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 very versatile and um a great place for that stuff so while we were talking i had a casting idea if you're going to be parsifal for a Kundri that we would not think of immediately, but I think she would be a terrific Kundri. She'd have to study some German too, is Sandra Radvanovsky. Oh boy. Oh I boy. think would be a phenomenal Kundri. And I don't know if anyone has ever proposed that role to her. I have, I'm, I'm quite close to her, but I, but I don't know that, but um, I'll tell you that we had fun in Malta and, and every, everything was closed. We had to stay in a bubble. So it was pretty much just us all the time for a couple of days. We had to get tested every day. Uh, we had no audience, of course. This was a uh, film. But um, it, it, um, it was great to sing again. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know much that Sandra cannot sing quite, quite, She's quite phenomenal. frankly. She, she really has one of these voices. First of all, it's two voices, not one. Because yeah. the sheer volume and power that that... I mean, I have a, I have a very penetrating voice my 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 myself, and it's the first time that my coll longtime collaborator Anton here in Malta said, "Woo, that, you know, like 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 she 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 at least matches you." And he was being, I think he was being diplomatic. So so yeah, I mean, it was great, and of course, there was um, Chris Van Horn, who's one of the, um, in my humble opinion, one of the best. Um, world's uh, uh, bass baritones, and we had an upcoming singer from Malta, Marvik Monreal who you can hear of a lot. She is in the late 20s and she has this beautiful, deep mezzo-soprano, sometimes even um, contralto-ish voice that is just gorgeous and full of color. Think molten gold, molten gold mixed with chocolate. And she is one of the scholars of my foundation in Malta. 
We helped 80 different young people from all the plethora of the performing arts. We raised more than a million dollars uh, the past couple of years. And she's one of the best um, scholars that, that, that the foundation has produced so far. So very proud of her as well. So speaking of foundations, and not just yours, I discovered in my research that Malta has the highest percentage of people who give to charity of any nation in the world. 83% of the Maltese people either have foundations, donate to charity, are benevolent in one way or another. Is that part of the heritage? It's... <laughs> Oh boy, I, 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 you know, I, I would like to give a balanced view because I mean, soon people are going to start thinking that the Malta have unicorns with wings and Pegasus is here and Perseus as well. Now we, we, we are, uh, we're Mediterranean. We, we, we're Latin. We're the ultimate Latin. We, we're warm-hearted. Um, we, 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 we're a port, and people literally, we're a port. So we're welcoming and. The, the real true Maltese, you know, the, the one that opens the door uh, for you and helps you, generally speaking, we still have that. And yes, we are a nation with a big heart. The counterpart of that, we also um, hotheads. So yes. that's part of the heat as well, <laughs> but, but that's, the, that's the negative side. But, but we are ultimately a nation of good-hearted people. And um, of course, we have our defects. Of course, we have uh, things that are, we're not proud of, like any other nation in the world, really. But mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, in the list of, of bad things of the different countries from all over the world, Malta links pretty much in the law because we were too small to do harm anyway. So, it's, so, so pro- it has to do with that. Um, I always say, though, if Malta was at least the size of Sicily, um, uh, Europe would speak Maltese. <laughs> I always joke about that, I have to say. Um, the first time I visited Malta was because one of my very favorite operas is Berlioz's Le Troyen. Mm-hmm. And when I was living in Italy, I decided to travel to Carthage in Tunisia to visit and walk through all the sites of Dido and Aeneas and the whole story. And I flew from Rome to Malta on Air Malta. And I visited Malta for a few days. And then I transferred off to Tunis and visited Tunisia and then just connected on the way back through Malta. And in the late 1970s, the island was very, I'm going to use a word, I don't mean it in a negative way, innocent. No, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was innocent. It was sort of, it was not connected to social media because it didn't mm-hmm. exist. And it had a genuine feeling about it. The people reminded me of Sicilians. They reminded me also of people from Abruzzo in Italy. And I came to learn that in one of the centuries past, most of the Italian population of Malta came from a town called Celano. And they were brought to Malta to populate the island so that there's a very strong Abruzzese influence. And they, too, are very hospitable people. But one day, if you decide to sing Aeneas in Le Troyen, have you been to Carthage and Tunis? And have you explored that part of the Mediterranean? I I mean, um, I I love archaeology, right? And I love the fact that Lots of myths that we thought were myths are actually um, were actually based on real cities like Troy, for example. And we're finding more and more that Troy um, indeed might have existed, indeed might have. Um, and same thing with um, Gozo. If we, if we take Gozo, uh, for example, we call it the island of Calypso. That's where, um, uh, oh, what was his name? Uh, oh, boy. The one who was uh, not, not Hercules. Ulysses. Ulysses yeah. was um, abducted by the by the uh, goddess or, or or witch Calypso and um, kept there with his troops for for fighting two or three years. I'm not sure exactly. So yes, I mean, I I love beyond the, the relation it might have with research for a role or or the feel of a role, but I love archaeology in, in in general. I have been to Turkey on a couple of um, interesting sites, but never I've never been yet to um, Tunisia, which of course um, we have a lot of a lot of things in common with Tunisia. There, there, there are um, still there a, a, a section of the population that that are direct descendants of the of us Maltese. 
So, um, you know, I mean, I mean, uh, th th this is the thing when I confront racism, if I was a leader, I would, you know, how everybody be, is being vaccinated right now um, um, and uh, how easy, quiet it is to do it in, in a way, because I mean, look at the success stories of the US, success story of, of of the UK and a success story of Malta. We're, we're, we're one of the leading countries when it comes to vaccinations. But um, I would, uh, DNA tests are pretty cheap. I think they're cheaper than the vaccines. And to, to eradicate, one of the ways to help eradicate racism is have people take a DNA test so that they see, and I'm being sarcastic here, how pure um, they are. We're a mix. If you go far enough, uh, most of us came from, um, from Africa, most and some of us have even Neanderthal blood. I mean, if you start reading, um, you'd really see the ignorance that racism um, 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 is, and how really diverse we are, and how really how how we are all ultimately all, if not brother and sister, Same. definitely definitely cousins. I on my Facebook page, I when I describe myself, I describe myself as an egalitarian, and I mean that. I was very influenced by French thought in that regard. I believe that we are all equal and that we all are deserving of the same human rights as every other person, male, female, any other gender expression, uh, any race, any color, any language, any religion, any absence of religion. We're all equal. We're all citizens of the earth and we, we protect it and we need to protect it more. Absolutely. So when you go to Tunisia, the food is fabulous. Can't I don't imagine. even know that about Tunisia. The food is sensational. No, I didn't. I didn't know. Oh, no. my. It's really yeah. it's a discovery. Um, if you're in Paris before you get to Tunisia, there are good Tunisian restaurants in Paris. In Paris. Okay. But. Um, it's really, it's quite something. It's remarkable, the food in Tunisia. I like my food, Fred, <laughs> a lot. So, I, have to, I have to do a lot of boxing to burn the calories. <laughs> and, 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 and I love wine as well, which is... I which know. Is, uh, I, one more Maltese question, although it's opera related. Sure. One of my revelations many years ago was I was in Paris working and went to the Paris Opera and attended what was described as Robert Wilson's Madame Butterfly because of the American stage director, Robert Wilson, mm -hmm. with his famous people striking poses and so on and this kind of stuff, which is a stereotype. But I thought the best Robert Wilson production I had ever seen was his Madame Butterfly in Paris. And one of the reasons for that was a singer that I didn't know named Miriam Gauchi. And... Have you ever met her? Would you talk about Miriam? Oh yeah, Gauchi? of course. I mean, Miriam, Miriam Gauchi. Um, she was uh, a so Maltese soprano. She, of course, she's still alive. Um, I don't think she sings anymore. But she had an extraordinary career um, in the in the in the nineties. Um, I think as well. I'm I'm again going out on a limb here. I think that maybe the the end of the eighties as well. I'm not sure. But it was, um, you know, she, she sang regularly in Munich at the Vienna State Opera, um, a lot in Germany and in Austria. Yeah, she was absolutely very um, beautifully voiced, first of all, beautiful voice. And she had these very big expressive eyes that really yes. drew you in. I never saw her perform live. I sang with her in, in the latter part of her career in Malta. It was a concert. I think it might have been the only time I've sang with her, but, but I might be mistaken. But I mean, the, the instrument retained its beauty. Um, of course, we all grow older and we all like, you know, like, like, like I will have an end as well. But I mean, in her in her prime, when, when she was singing, she was absolutely riveting. And she draw you in not only with her beauty she was she was a beautiful woman uh, with a beautiful voice but she was she was also very expressive in her acting and, and everything she reminded me a bit of victoria de los angeles in terms of her aspect her aura her fair eyes. comparison it's a fair comparison absolutely the eyes i'm not saying vocally although some of that but something about her character and her butterfly her chocho son was Butterfly was one of her best roles. It was absolutely it was just phenomenal. And that's such a hard role. Ooh, yeah. And to do it in a Robert Wilson production is harder still, although it worked. But those productions have their own rules. I saw her do it at the Met as well in a more conventional production. And she was marvelous. She only sang Butterfly and Mimi at the Met. Yeah. 
Uh, but I was very, when I think of the great opera performances I've been to in my life, and I'm sure that's one of them, yeah, 10,000 opera performances, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, one of them would certainly be Miriam Gauchi in Paris in 1994. Wonderful. So let's talk about you. Uh, you, you know, I think you're great. I don't have to say that. I'm not saying that as an opera expert, I'm saying it as someone who knows opera and as your friend. Um, and I've loved watching the progression of your career because you are still a young man in tenor terms yeah i think it's fair to say you're 43 if i remember yeah, yeah. and you've accomplished a great deal and you've done it very intelligently and you've picked roles well and i like to hear that now you're looking at parsifal rather than 10 years ago um at the Met, where I've heard you a lot, you have sung many, many roles. You're a big favorite here in New York. And I didn't know that when you were starting out, your very first role in Malta was as Macduff. Yeah. In Verdi's Macbeth. Yeah. And it's a, you're fabulous at that role. It's a short role. Talk about that role because he comes on at the end, he sings this beautiful aria to the chorus. And he often steals the opera away from Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. Macbeth. Yeah, it, it's terrible for, for Macbeth and for Lady Macbeth. It's absolutely, I feel very bad because if you sing that aria well and you have a beautiful voice and you feel it, you, you, you got to show. And Lady Macbeth and Macbeth are really tough roles. And yeah. I remember when I sang with Thomas Hampson in, in London, um, I had a huge success. And when I came for makeup and he was there before me, he said, I don't want to see you. Just go out. Just, just leave. Leave the theater if possible. Just I don't want to see you. He was like, he was like, he was really, he was joking, of course, but it was like, no, Joseph, no, really. Oh, get out. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, I, the way to imitate Tom is, is, is a Canadian Sean Connery, you know, like there's a bit of the show. I was going to say that was an excellent imitation. <laughs> there know, is, Tom. there is a, there's a little bit of that, but yeah, I mean, and, and he, 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 um, I mean, it's a great role. And if you have a great, um, actor as well as, as being a singer in Macbeth, and he is a great actor, Tom. Um, in, the, in the banquet scene, when he's seeing the ghosts, he was so taken by, in fact, I'm just getting goosebumps right now just by, by thinking about it. He was so engulfed in the whole thing, and he was so expressive that I started thinking like, is he really seeing something? Because <laughs> it was that intense. And of course, I, I sang with great Macbeth. I mean, like, um, Jelko Lucic is another one. Um, Carlos Alvarez, I think as well. Uh, and Mark Rucker, um, um, an American baritone, did a fantastic, fantastic Macbeth. Um, so it's it's always it's always um, you know I mean it's 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 Shakespeare and Verdi at its best. Uh, Mark Rucker will be joining. I don't know if you know this. Mark will be joining me on this program in a couple of months. Had no idea. No. Yeah. Wonderful man. One him and Sadie. I mean, just just wonderful people. Oh, wonderful. And he Henry really and there's his Rigoletto. I'm not sure I've heard better life. And I've sung with some fantastic Rigolettos, including Giorgio Chebrian, uh, which was my yes. stage debut at the age of 15 as a, as a second tenor in the, in the, in the, in the, in the choir in Malta. And George uh -huh. Chebrian was a fantastic singer. But Mark Rucker, I mean, he, he had everything for the role, for was really big, beautiful, um, 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 cook and, and voiceful of color and incredible extension at the top as well. Really, really wonderful. And he was my first ever colleague at the age of 19 in 1997. So um, him and Hao Zhang Tian was Banco. And, mm -hmm. I, and I'm sure you, you've, you've heard Hao Zhang Tian many, many times in, yes. in, in, at the Met. Um, and I think the Lady Macbeth was 97 in Gozo. In the small, I think it was Pamela Kucinich, another American singer, but I'm not sure. I think it was Pamela Kucinich, though. Um. Briefly about Thomas Hampson, you just did a fantastic imitation of Tom that I'm going to send it to him. Uh, I think you know that I do for Adagio Fred Plotkin on Fridays. He does Tom on Thursdays. Yes, I, I've done so it as well. I've done that. We're going to have to do, create a show like Joseph in January or something. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph in January, June, and July. <laughs> Another role of yours that I really love because I love this opera so much and you do it so well is Gabriele Adorno in mm -hmm. Verdi's Simone Bocanegra. 
the character has such an arc because we first don't like him and then we come to respect him <laughs> uh, because of the virtues that he shows. Yeah. And, you know, I, I know that Verdi wrote many magnificent operas and I love all of them. But on many days, if I have to name my favorite Verdi opera, it is Simone Bocanegra mm-hmm. because it's so human. And each character, because it's set over 25 years, has a very long arc. And we, people who don't understand that opera say, well, how come he didn't know that that was his daughter? And if you're being realistic, you're not fastening on what's so good about the opera of Simone Bocanegra because it's about humanity and about fate and about family love and romantic love and service to country and uh, the Republic of Genoa, which Verity was very fond of. And I know that Genoese visited Malta a lot and there's a Genoese thread commercially. They use Malta as a trading post. And so all of that feeds into it, but talk about Gabriele Adorno because he's special. Um, Gabriel Adorno is, and I don't mean this in a disparaging or negative way, but it, what he sees, what you get. He, I don't know, uh, he becomes the leader, and I hope that he really grew as a man, as a person, because he's not diplomatic at all. He 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 he, he acts and, and then he thinks. Um, he is testosterone and impetuosity. Um, 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 mixed together, but he is a warrior. He he is a warrior, and he he is very, you know, he is a very uncompromising man. You know, it's black and white. There's no shades of gray. It's black and white, and and you know, it, 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 it's like and Verdi does it brilliantly, even musically. You know, when he discovers that that, that Amelia is the is the daughter of the Doge, the, the reaction is so anticlimactic that it's almost stupid. But it's exactly what Verdi wanted. It's exactly what works because. Nothing else would, because other than he would become scheming, and and Adorno is anything but scheming. So he's a big heart, big warrior, probably a powerful man, and uh, that I hope that by the end, after the opera, um, he he had to he grew a lot because to be a leader, you have to be diplom- diplomatic, and you have to be uh, sometimes um, you know quite the a man that compromises because otherwise you're going to be going to war every day. Um, and and his his um, his idealistic his his almost infantile love um, 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 for Amelia that is very you know uh, uh, when he storms for example the the, the Senate or whatever you call it that uh, when he says oh, Trujita Lorenzino you know and and he confronts the Doge he, he as I said before he acts and then he thinks oh was that a good thing I did <laughs> I'm not sure so let me give you something to think about maybe you've thought about this already. Um, I see Gabriele as the junior Simone Bocanegra because some respects, yeah. everything that you just described about Gabriele was Simone Bocanegra 25 years earlier cool. yeah. about being black and white and transigent, yeah. challenging of Fiesco, who is an even older man and yeah. wisdom from an older era. And what we see are three generations of men yeah. plus one very important woman. And these three men represent maybe the failure to learn from our errors and learn from history, or maybe in the case of Gabriele, that he will be better and different. Um, there, when Simone is dying, he says, Kanjo, Kanjo, I will change. Yep. And that to me is so important because I think what Simone is saying is not just a message to his daughter but also to the man who was his enemy, who now loves and will marry his daughter. And for the sake of Genoa, learn from my mistakes. And as much as in Wagner, the ring for Brunhilde is all about education and learning. I see that in Simone Bocanegra, the opera. Oh, yeah. I I mean, I mean. Uh, absolutely, and and um, you know, I, I've I've done it with um, with a couple of baritones, and and of course I've done it with Placido in um, in both London and both in New York, and of course, I mean, he is a tenor. So as a, as a, as a color, Placido, even when he sings baritone, it's a tenor. But what he brings is this old, is this age, is this wisdom that only age can give you. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, Simon Bocanegra, um, um, in his second career as a, as, as, a, as a baritone, is by far, in my, again, humble opinion, um, some people might disagree, but by far, in my opinion, it's his best role. Because he brings his, uh, I mean, remember, so that's the old line, the old tenor, and I'm the tenor. And so it's, it's, very, it's a very similar kind of juxtaposition you know what i mean like like you know like 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 he he used to be um a leading tenor superstar tenor i'm sort of um, you know the one emerging and, and in the opera that works in in almost uh um um in a parallel way just just beautifully and of course he whatever um and people's opinion about about whether it's a, it's a true baritone of course it's not he says it he knows it but he really brings in in, in certain roles really justice and he always made me cry on stage in the end when he's when he's dying when he's yeah. when he's you know he, he he's a he's a he is just an incredible incredible artist um and i had you know i'm so honored to 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 have shared the the, the stage with him in, in, in that moment but um so yeah but you you're so right um um again tom is is, is another one i I've done it in, in vienna with him um he he was you know extremely good in in in, in boca negra um but yeah it's a very it's a very interesting verdi um opera and it has that that thing that you mentioned that the the characters develop over a long period of time adding colors and adding context to the whole piece I agree with you about Domingo being just a fabulous Simón Bocanegra. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it really fit him. I said to him that I felt that it was the equal of his Otello. Yeah. It was sort of the latter day Otello. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. With such wisdom and humanity. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but my very first opera that I ever directed was Simón Bocanegra. No, I didn't know that. It was the year you were born, now that we're talking about it. Wow. Um, at La Scala. And wow. my cast included Pietro Capuccilli as Simone, wow. Morella Freni as Amelia. Was it Carreras? A young or man named Jose Carreras. It was Carreras, yes. Yeah. Exactly. And Nikolai Giaurov and then Ruggiero Ramondi. And, and who and was in cast A? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking, Fred. I'm joking. Who was the first cast? That is that is a dream cast, and of course, I'm 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 just joking there. And a very good conductor named Claudio Abbado. Wow, magnificent. I mean, wow. my you know, I don't say too much publicly about favorites, but my favorite conductor, Claudio Abbado. Claudio Abbado. Okay. So, um, there are many magnificent conductors, but he really, to me, he was the one who opened up worlds to me about not just about music but about art and never met him but he of course was it was before my time but he he um he, he looks on him in, in all his performances those that are recorded especially with video you can see that he was a good man i don't i might be completely wrong but he was um, a wonderful man but he really looked and and this is um this is so important um, um for an artist to 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 have in the podium, a, a, a man not not riddled with insecurities and chips on his shoulders, but a man that is there to make music, that is there to to open this two way bridge, two way road, highway of musical information and emotions. That's it's like the internet. The performance in the opera is like the internet. You have literally this to and fro of of energy. And when you create this link, sometimes it's so powerful that you can almost touch it and cut it with, 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 your, with, with your finger. It, it really is. Um, that is when I perform, when he's, when he's having a good night. It's like, it's like uh, being a psychic. When you're having a good night, you know you have the audience in, in, in your palm. They haven't applauded yet. You know, like when middle of the, in, but you're going to the end of the aria, you can feel the energy that is just about to erupt. It's like when 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 the when the clouds are pregnant with water and it's about to rain, you can feel the static that has changed and it's about to happen. And 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 you said in the beginning of this interview, you know, um, you much prefer I'm paraphrasing experience experiencing opera live rather than on video. And and you're exactly right. This is why opera must have a future in the theater without amplification, because the minute you introduce something like that, you are um, removing what makes it a unique and special experience. The power of the voice without any aid to travel in a relatively big space 
just with the power of the body, with the acoustics of the body, and with the acoustics of the place. It's just, it, it, it's just, it's just, it's just wonderful. And uh, sometimes you have to sing, you have amplifier because you're in big arenas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, you know, but in in many cases. Um, Amplifying voices in theaters, which of course is not happening yet, and hopefully it will not, um, but it, it would be tantamount to diluting Chateau Cheval Blanc 1982 with Seven Up with 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 soda. It, 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 you know, it's a shame. I would never do that. Um, no, 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 me either. <laughs> that would be some very expensive soda, by the way. <laughs> it would. You make a very important point because. When I take young people or even not so young people to the opera and introduce them to opera, as I love to do, I at a certain point say, well, you know that he's not using a microphone. Oh, yeah. And usually you see it an expression of disbelief on their faces. Yeah. Because you have a voice and Sandra Radvanovsky has a voice. And there are certain singers who have a voice that just completely arrests you and you feel it in your ears and you can feel it on your skin and you can feel the vibration. Yeah. And yeah. I then say to them, now go out and hear something with amplification. You won't feel that. You will feel the pressure of the amplification, but not the tactile, the feeling of the voice that happens that the great and the gifted opera singers, Domingo has it affect you that way. Yeah. And there are many, many, I don't want to leave them out, but I'm mentioning just two or three to give people the idea. Sandra Radvanovsky, it's not just the volume. It's a very particular quality to her voice. A ping that it's like in, 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 in 5.1, I like mm -hmm. to say, because you, you can't really sometimes make up from where it's coming from. And, 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 and that's, that's, I think, the ability of the great singers is to sing for so long. And, and if there's one thing I'm proud of, my, next year is my 25th year. Of course, I had my ups and downs. Of course, I had my, my good performances my, and, and my less than good performances. And some, a few, not many, over 25 years that I'd rather forget. Um, you know, when, when you're ill, you're ill. But, um, but generally speaking, I was very lucky with the health of my voice. I never had to go under the knife. I never had to, you know, never had a big major, major problem. And um, I think that, that is testament to how well I was schooled by my teacher, Paul Ashak, my, my, my first teacher. And of course, then I had, a, and I still have a, a series of collaborators and teachers that I, I go to. Um, in fact, that's the first thing I'm going to do once this bloody thing is over, because I, I missed, you can study and coach online, um, but it's, it's not the same thing. We need, we need interaction. And, and um, you know, it's, it's good to have this technology, to have this option, but I mean, if this is what's, what opera is going to be long term, you know, I, th I think it, would, it, would, it wouldn't work. So we need to return um, to a modicum of normality ASAP for the benefit of the art, for the benefit of the thousands of singers out there, for the benefit of everyone, because... I agree. When, when they, they, they asked Winston Churchill in the Second World War, um, we should cut funding for the arts, Winston Churchill said, well, then what are we fighting for? And it's a very, very, you know, poignant, you know, poignant um, 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 view of, of- You don't do a Winston arts, Churchill so. imitation? I, I, I haven't heard him the real voice enough. Um, no, no, no. You know, I, 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 know, I know you, you're very good at doing invitations of people. I'm, I'm just terrible. 1982 wine. Um, I have two questions and they do not go together. So I don't want you oh. to think that one leads to the other. Okay. Oh, sorry. It's very important. Um, the first question is I've seen you be wonderful in really bad productions and that cannot be easy. And I'm not naming the productions because maybe you like them and it's just my feeling and my opinion, but a production where the character and you were the title character really was not served at all and gets in the way of your fully could get in the way of your fully expressing the character nonetheless musically you were wonderful but i felt that you and the whole cast were very limited by the ideas of the production and i said i'm not naming the production or the okay. theater or anything but when you are faced with a situation like that 
assuming that you also don't care for the production. What do you do? How does it work in rehearsal and how does it work in performance? There are two ways of doing this when it happens. A is tantrums, walking out, um, um, fighting or arguing. Even if in a civil way, it's still fighting and arguing. That's, that's the first take, and I don't do that. What I do is, it's not up to me unless it's something really outlandish and I cannot physically perform well. It's not up to me to decide if it's bad or not, because I am just seeing my part. I can't be singing on stage and interacting with everyone and everything and being in the, in the stage, in the uh, auditorium at the same time. So I leave the, the, that judgment to people like you, to the audience, ultimately to the people who buy the um, ticket. So I'm there at the service of the um, director, stage director, as much even, even if I hate it. I try to find things to love. I try to find things. But, but people sometimes tell me, oh, why didn't you walk out? How could you? What about your artistic integrity? I, it's not up to me. That's up to the audience, to the critics, to the artistic director. We are there paid to sing and to make music and to make the best with what we're, we're given. So I never, um, um, I never, uh, and when I, 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 I was confronted with something silly, I just said it in a nice way, in a nice way. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, for example, uh, once in a production in Germany uh, of Romeo and Juliet, uh, the, the director was a wonderful guy, really sweet guy, not at all, but, but he wanted, uh, when I sang, he wanted the Tibalt, to, who, um, who's dead by then, to sing high seas. He just wanted, his name would be, I said, I said, listen, um, I, I said, I said, um, I'm not going to mention, I said, listen, they're already going to throw the seats at us. Please don't do this because this is like that I, you know, that I can't, you know, I can't be singing or the day and somebody is this with dissonance because, you know, screaming I sees. Um, and, and I also never had an argument. I had one argument once in 25, in next year, 25 years with a director. Uh, uh, um, um, and and was only because completely uh, out of the script because never heard it. He had the in 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 a carman. He had the baritone uh, puff, real cigarette smoke in my face oh. whilst I was whilst I was singing. And that and with this distance, this was his head and my head. So that was the only time when I when I really had um, an issue. Uh, really, in 25 years, that's not a bad record. But I'm there at the service of the director. The director, it's not, it's not. I can have my opinions, but I don't express them. Certainly not be before the run is over, because it's not fair on, on anyone. But I never walked out. I never walked out. Um, and I'm and I'm gonna mention one of the productions, which was re really bizarre. It was 2002, I think. Um, it was a really young man. And I was singing, I was called by the Bavarian State Opera to sing The Duke in a, in a Rigoletto when I was a monkey, when I was the monkey. I saw that. <laughs> the Doris Dory. So, so the it was, was Doris Dory. Doris Dory. Yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I didn't rehearse it with her. Uh, but but uh, the Vargas was in the in the first cast and he left and he was then replaced by Tito Beltran in the winter performance and, and in the summer. And I said, I said, I said, yeah, Kale, Mr. Kale, you have to wear this mask. I said, what do you mean the beginning? No, no, no. All the I said, okay, listen, I'm not being difficult. You can't sing the Duke with a party mask all over your face. It's impossible. <laughs> is the Duke is one of the most hardest music ever written. This, you know, I mean, I can have it in the beginning, I have it when I'm singing, you know, and they removed it. And and um, you know, and, and sometimes if only if we leave egos behind and, and we're just reasonable and we just, you know, take 10 deep breaths. And then say, um, 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 uh, you know, uh, um, just just resolve things diplomatically. There's always, you know, the the politics of persuasion rather than the politics of confrontation. I I, I really I mean you can count them on I think two or three fingers over 25 years, the the, the arguments I had. And um, and I've I've worked with some um, um, notoriously, or at least the aura, uh, difficult directors, and then I, I, I work with them, and, and and I never, two months, never even a little, 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 little misunderstanding, never. So I think it really is the attitude. Um, 
we are privileged to be doing this. This is something that we're, we're, we're you know, say being, um, you know, maybe being an actor is more fun, I don't know, but, but it's like, it's up there. It's up there with, with great things to do. We, we're paid to, 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 uh, to do what we love. In fact, I always tell people, I, 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 I don't really get paid to sing. I get paid to worry about it. And it's and it's the way that's the that's the real. I get paid uh, so that I stay away from my family, not to drink alcohol or, or smoke one beloved cigar every once every once in a while because I have to be in top shape. Uh, I'm paid not to talk for days before the performance, really, not to have a social life, you know, to to live like a her- like a hermit or like a priest. Um, in fact, I know many priests, and mon- and most of them have more fun than me, and they're priests, you know, like they so. Smoke and drink, <laughs> you know, like yeah, so, yeah. So it's like, so it's like, um, yeah, I'm I'm paid to worry. And um, when we mention stage stage nerves, uh, um, at least the the singers I know, we're not worried about if we can sing it or not. We know we can sing. What we're worried about is whether we're able to give, to sing the role the way we know we can sing it. That's that's the stage nerves in a, in a nutshell. I agree with 98% of what you just said, but I'm going to push back on the other 2%. Okay. The opera in question that you sang in that I thought the production was terrible is an opera I like very, very much. Okay. And it's an opera that I take people to if I want to turn them on to opera. And I took several people to different performances in that run of that opera. And all of them came away saying, I didn't like that opera. And I know it's an opera that under normal circumstances, people just love. And it's a very easy opera for me to teach to people because they love the music, they love Mm -hmm. the story, they love everything about it. And frankly, in the case of this production, they all came away saying, I didn't like that opera. So the problem is it's not your fault, but I often find I have a problem exciting people about opera. If I take them, I'm very in favor of modern, it's not that, but incoherent and stupid, there's not a good way to turn people onto opera. But unfortunately in that case, I had already bought all my tickets to take different people. So I had to go and see it. I was happy to hear you and your, your colleagues who were great. But um, nonetheless, I had to explain to my guests after, that's not what the opera is about, but you heard a great <laughs> musical performance. You're absolutely right. I'm not saying that um, we shouldn't criticize or we shouldn't even slam bad productions. What I'm saying is that in the creation of... If you're if you're against it, when you're creating it, us, the cast, not you. You're you're there as as a critic, as an audience, as a, as a connoisseur, right, and everything. But 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 us, if we're gonna hate it, whilst we create it, we're gonna have make it even worse. And in some, it's not the rule, but there were some exceptions where it looked bad, but then when it came together, it was it was good. Reference bad productions, I think they're a crime. They're a crime in this cash trap time for opera. Mm-hmm. They're a crime because they push people away from opera. They're a crime because sometimes they cost a lot of money. And, 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 and for what? And especially in some European countries, when you have people, I, I want them to boo, because if they don't boo, it's not written about. It's not a success. Um, and, and that's sad. That's sad because we're in a society today, um, negative society, negativity, bad stories sell, bad stories tweet, bad stories have hits. I, I give this example, my friend and great colleague, Roberto Alania, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that um, when he left uh, the stage at La Scala, he did the right thing uh, because I know some inside information, people who are with him, who have who been my friends for 20 years, and they know how he was being psychologically conditioned to 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 leave and to and when you but you know when you're booed after after you know people might you know after the first aria when he didn't he didn't crack he didn't do anything you know which which was you know and i mean it, it, it was it was set up somehow it was set up and 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 there's a lot of proof for this but um you know but but um and I, I spoke to him, he said, Joseph, I've never sold so many records I've have never been on CNN on a <laughs> but it's true have Roberto been on stage that night and sang like Enrico Caruso slash Franco Corelli slash Del Monaco, all three voices in one, people have said, oh, he sang absolutely magnificent. And it would have died there. And nobody would have noticed. And in the past, when, when, you know, when great singers sang, 
the, it it was the big performances that 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 made the story, you know. And made, yeah, of course, there were occasions when people were booed, and that's fine. If they were sung bad, fine. I'm I'm, I'm not against booing at all. But when when you have an exclusive new system built on negative things and on and and the system and the media. And this, unfortunately, is responsibility of, of some media outlets as well. When it's when when they exclusively um, um, inflate and 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 give gravitas towards the bad, 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 and ignore the good or ignore this the other side of the story, and it's and it's and it's happening as well in 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 the arts that unless somebody doesn't go naked or unless somebody doesn't you know um, um, do something really uh, outlandish, we don't hit the news, and that's unfortunately. This, the the state of the play at the moment. In part, that's because um, in America, at least, the arts are often seen as a commodity and something is good if it sold a lot of tickets. Now, Verdi agreed with that. Verdi always said that he knew an opera was good if the theater was full. And when he wrote Rigoletto and they, it kept selling out and selling out and selling out, he knew that he had written a good opera. Uh, he was being a bit modest there because he wrote many good operas, including mm. ones that were not successful initially, like Traviata, like Simone Bocanegra, that went on to become classics. Great hits. Yeah. yeah. But um, in the case of Europe, um, they cover what the Italians call polemica, polemics. And Roberto Alagna, who I also know, that production was Aida. Yeah. And there's a particular issue at La Scala, which I can speak as an insider because I work there, that at La Scala, for the audience, not for the artists, nothing is ever good enough. So that when I worked there in the 70s and we had Franey and Pavarotti and Domingo and Carreras and Capuccilli and everyone, uh, Renato Bruzzone, just every, Fiorenzo Cosotto had a birthday the other day, Everyone was there. Abado was conducting. Gavazzini was still conducting. People like that. And audience members and older people would say to me, well, you know, we had Visconti and, and we had Callas and we had Tibaldi and we had Corelli. I said, I know and they're wonderful, but we're in a golden age now with the people we have currently. No, in so much, nothing very much. No, but I'm, I'm not. I'm not talking even about the audience. I mean, there are some audience who have earned that right to to be picky. That's fine. That that that. I love um, 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 fans saying, "Ah, oh, uh, 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 Calais crap is you know Bezal is much better." No, no, but Calais is not crap. You know, but I love this. This is what yeah. this is what keeps the light. My problem is the media. That that the way that well, that's that, that, what I'm referring to. That's the problem because the, if it doesn't create, if it's not a disaster, and if it's negative, we have to sensationalize it even more, and we have to have to make it even bigger than it is. And and it was it wasn't always like that. Before it was. Um, uh, um, um, oh, let me give you an example. This is brilliant. So once I sang in Paris, and I and I and I think that I that by the end of the uh, concert I had sung fourteen. It was Champs Elysees uh, um, uh, or, or the Garnier. I, I forgot which one was here, but it was sold out. It was one one of my recording tours, and I was in particularly good voice that evening. And I and I um, uh, not because it's you know I, I hate giving compliments to myself, but I was on fire that night. One of the nights yeah, I was on fire. Yeah. And I and I sung. I think the program was fourteen pieces um, um, long. I had five encores. wasn't enough, so I was taking requests from the audience live and singing and repeating the encores. So we had run out of encores. So by the end of the night, I had sung twenty-two numbers between arias, full arias, and, and songs. And I remember one of the reviews, which was really hilarious. Uh, hey, yeah, yeah, he sang very well, beautiful voice, you know, a total of 21 or 22 numbers, but we must not forget that once Jilly sang 31. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> I sang, like, Jilly has been dead for more than half a century. Are you crazy? Like, what? But so I love, I, I didn't I didn't think it was a bad review at all. It was a great review. But like, if you have, if you have to go back to Jilly to just find something to say, it's so... You know, uh, um, and that was, and it was a wonderful reading. I'm not complaining, but uh, I mean, but the fact that it was a it was a, as you say, a much older critic who have who had of course heard everyone, you know, probably in his ninety. But 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 it's oh yeah, but we must not forget that Julia sang um, thirty-one numbers in the same in the same uh, uh, theater or something like that. 
because it, during those times, of course, there was nothing more, more to do. And Gilly was a vocal phenomenon. He was a, like a volcano of a constant volcano of sound. And, and the orchestra used to, used to go home and they used to push a piano and he used to entertain the audience even after the whole show was, was, was done. And yeah, I mean, those days will never come back. There is no doubt about that, but we must keep what we have today alive, hone it and, and try not to let it die because um, I might be in the minority that think, that think this, but we are in the risk of losing all present all today. We, we, there's, a really, there's a real risk that, of, of it happening. Um, and, and if anything, COVID has shown how fragile the whole system and structure is and how as well unfair the whole system is um, as well. So hopefully in the post-COVID world, things will be a little bit more balanced. Well, simply put, because opera is so collaborative and so it's it's a human creation. Yeah, absolutely. You cannot be virtual in opera and have it be good, yeah. which is really what I love about opera and why I said to you mm -hmm. earlier, I don't really listen to opera on video because it's just not the same. So my final question, because then I know we need to go, um, and it does not relate to the previous question at all. No problem. That. The last time I saw you live and heard you live was in Norma at the Met, which not everyone loved that production, but I did. Yeah. And I don't want to ask you about the production, but I want to ask you just about some of the ideas in the production, which I found very novel in a good way. Uh, was it McVicker who did that production? I forget. It was McVicker. And I, and okay. I, I uh, disclaimer, I absolutely adore him. I adore yeah. him, and yeah. and I adore his work. Uh, I don't know him, but I really love the adore his work, but also the ideas. And not everybody embraced the ideas, <clears throat> but I felt it made very good sense. Uh, the story of Norma, basically, she's a druid priestess. Adalgisa is in her temple. Uh, they get a lot of terrific music together. Polione, you, uh, great music, bad guy, ostensibly bad guy, um, who has father two children with norma but nonetheless um is interested in not all geez and probably many other women i see certain connections between that story and the story of medea with the killing of the children or potential killing of the children but what struck me in this production i want to know what you thought is that to me it was seen from the eyes and the feelings of adult Jesus. And that Norma and Polione were the leading characters, but nonetheless, I won't say it became Adalgisa's story, but Adalgisa. No, that's right. Their production was absolutely like that. It, yeah. it, you, you really, um, you really hit the nail on its head. It, it, it's it's really and 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 yeah, it can be interpreted like that. I mean, hey, it, it's much better than being in a spaceship, right? Um, yes. or, or being in a land farm or being in a bee colony. I mean, I mean, because or honestly, being a monkey. Yeah, or being a monkey, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I I I hate the role of Polione. I will never sing it again because one of the most oh. ungrateful roles. Um, there's some beautiful music of this excruciatingly difficult aria and excruciatingly difficult cabaletta, and nobody cares. Um, um, and in, in fact, even surfing on YouTube and certain old recordings, very seldomly. Oh, let's let's listen to the aria of Polione because it's not it's not the main thing. All that opera is about is first of all um, um, the soprano, and it's all about Castadiba and, and 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 little else in the in the in the top hits. Of course, people like you that go deeper in opera, that's, that's a totally different um, 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 audience. But remember, if, if the opera, if audience, if audiences in opera are the 1% of society, you are 1% of, of that 1%. No, no, you are. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being, uh, uh, throwing compliments here, but obviously people who go as deep as you, uh, you, you they, they, they will not be more than 10 people a night, and that's being generous. Um, um, and probably nowadays will be much, 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 much less. That people that's why I talk to everybody at the intermissions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, but, it's, but, it's, but it's true. And... and um, but ultimately, um, and about the production as well, um, we are here, many colleagues and many conductors talking about respecting the composer and respecting the mu musical wishes and all in good with that. Absolutely, I agree. But few of them, if any, um, say this, we're there to entertain. 
um, and the composers, as you rightly said before, Verdi, you know, he changed stuff, he tweaked stuff, he wrote different versions till he entertained in a better way what, mm -hmm. what he did with Traviat, what he did with Bocca Negra, the different versions, et cetera, et cetera. And we're there to entertain. We're there to bring joy. And ultimately, um, if they ask me to do a production where I'm, where I'm an amoeba in space, I'll, I'll do it if I can with the limitations, but I would rather be in the setting that the, that the opera was written. Uh, for example, when, when the, let's go back to the movies. When movies, uh, when Mel Gibson did Braveheart, he didn't say, oh, you know what? I'm gonna do Braveheart in the desert. Um, and, you know, we're gonna be nomads and we're gonna be, you know, with camels. They didn't do that, why? Well, because, um, you know, uh, William Wallace was Scottish and in Scotland it rains all the time. There's no bloody sand. You know, the only sand is wet and it's near the sea, near the ocean. Um, so it's, it's you know, absolutely modernize it with, 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 with better love scenes, better sword fighting. And, and we do it. We do it at the moment at the Metropolitan, at, at Chicago Lyric, um, uh, even Houston always had incredible people teaching us how to fight and, and make it more realistic, but not by doing Lucia or, or Romeo Juliet in, in an office. Um, and, and this, and, and I remember this, um, I did a production in a city in Germany, which is very famous for its uh, business and for its, and, and it was based in an office and people have been there from Monday till Friday every day. And they come to the theater and you see desks and laptops and computers are gonna go, oh no, my God, not again. People want to be transported in a different audiovisual world. This is why opera is the most complete art form because it combines everything. It combines the paintings for the scenography, the costume, the, the, the dance, the ballet, the, the, uh, the acting, the voice. This is why it's the most complete art form. And if you don't respect that, even before the composer, right? Because the composer respect that first. He had laws. He had that sometimes can be broken and bent, but only in the service of um, entertainment. And ultimately, we are there to entertain, of course, with the respect towards the composer, of course, but we're there to fulfill um, 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 one person, you, the audience, the, 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 even the composer, he did stuff to be loved with some exceptions that do not make the rule. He, they wrote stuff to be enjoyed by the, 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 uh, the audience. From Mozart to Verdi, from Bach to, to everyone else, this is why they, they wrote music. So I'm going to conclude with two very quick observations and you can add stuff if you want. Sure. In the opera Norma, it's sort of a tradition that the woman who sings Clotilda, who's the maid, the, the caregiver to the two children of Norma, often becomes a very big star. So Joan Sutherland was the Clotilda for Maria Callas. And I with my with, with my teacher as Flavio Polasha. He was the really? Flavio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he used to take uh, Sutherland out to the cinema at the time. They were they were they were big friends at the time. Mm -hmm. And I when that moment in the opera comes where Clotilde gets to sing, always pay very close attention because I want to hear who the next Norma will be in 20 years. Yeah. It was Michelle Bradley. Oh, wonderful. It was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And I had never heard her before. And it just, did. were you aware and listening to Michelle Bradley? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean listen, she, she is, uh, uh, um, well, first of all, a wonderful colleague with, with, with an incredible voice. I mean, you can... You can you can see um, you know that, that 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 was a star in the making and and I, I lost touch lost touch with her unfortunately a couple of especially because of this pandemic but I mean as soon things reopen and if she took care of her instrument herself which I'm sure she has done um, she is power powerhouse of a voice to be reckoned with absolutely so I want our listeners to follow the name Michelle Bradley. Michelle Bradley, Bradley. fantastic, really sweet, sweet, sweet colleague. Lovely and the person. second thing is, you've said something in different ways that I agree with and admire for what you said. I had the great honor and great, great pleasure to work very often with Joan Sutherland, who I adored. And she was very down to earth, although she was maybe the greatest of all and, and very funny and very serious, but very professional. And she had an Australian accent, very heavy one that I can't fully imitate. I'll try to approximate it a bit. And 
when she wanted to say something that was simultaneously important but amusing, she would look at me from the side, very tall, and call me Mr. Plotkin instead of Fred, as she would say it in the Australian accent. <laughs> Mr. Plotkin, those of us who live to please must please to live. <laughs> and That's very good. It sounds like a riddle, but it's in effect everything mm. that you said. And, and I carry that with me all these years later because it's really at the foundation of it. And she said it very simply, but it's very wise. It's very, 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 very wise. I, I, I unfortunately never met her, but I, I record with Decca Records. And of course, they yeah. collaborated with her, with her a lot. And there's a story when Bergonzi replaced Luciano for Bello Masca. They were recording in Wales uh, and Bergonzi went to Wales and, and, and uh, um, in recording, uh, he, she saw him pray. I'm not sure if it was in a chapel or a makeshift chapel, but it was something like that. And, and she told him, uh, uh, Carlo, what are you doing? He said, uh, 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 John, I, I am uh, praying for my high C. And Sutherland turned around and said, God ain't listening. <laughs> <laughs> this apparently happened. This apparently, this, this, this apparently really happened. And, and, and that's, that's an, a sweet anecdote, funny tongue in cheek that I, that I, I know many others, but, but, but they're, they're not for why. Some for, other time, you and I will open that proverbial bottle of Maltese wine. Absolutely. And, and tell Joan Sutherland stories. Joseph, my friend, I thank you. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, I miss seeing and hearing you live. Zoom is great for what it does. Yeah. And I'm glad that we could share what we feel about our art form with listeners and keep up the good work and be strong. Yeah. And I thank you. I thank you, um, Fred, and hand on heart. Um, this wasn't an interview. This was really uh, an exchange of ideas and a conversation with one of opera's greats, which is you. Um, it, it was Thanks. really, no, no, I'm, not, I'm not being nice. This is really, really to have somebody so knowledgeable but doesn't sort of um, tell everyone about it and, and, and everybody knows you're knowledgeable, but you have a way of making your guest, whether uh, virtually like today or whether in person, really welcome and at ease. So kudos to you. Good night to everyone. And thanks for those who have had the patience to listen to me this evening.